Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much also to Sayu for coming so far. I know that it's a long way out uh, to the West Coast from the East Coast. And I'm very excited to talk today about your amazing book, in part because, as I told you backstage, this book is a ray of hope in a pretty dark time and at least lights a path forward in how we can imagine a different political space and changing institutions. So let's welcome Sayu again, because I'm so excited she's here. Thank you. So to start, I'm really interested in what motivated you to write a book on this? I know that you were obviously really involved in developing organizations focused on candidates running, but what motivated your drive to write this book and tell these stories and make sure that it got out to the public? Well, so before I answer that, let me say again, thank you to Town Hall and to you for, for moderating this conversation. And also, I have to tell you, like, no matter where I speak, no one ever sits in the front row. <laughs> do not understand it. Young people, old people, middle-aged people, people of color, everybody. Um, so, uh, and by the way, we all need to be in the front row in order for things to change. So let me just make a metaphor of that. Um, I started writing the book in January of 2016, and it was because I had been running the organization New American Leaders for several years, and I was just hearing these incredible stories from people about what they were encountering. Um, their own personal stories were amazing. And so I initially started writing it to be able to share those stories in ways that, uh, that drew some parallels and that kind of lifted up the details of life that they weren't talking about on the campaign trail. Um, and I was especially interested in sharing how these folks were contributing to our political life, because we often think about immigrants. The stories that we hear about immigrants, you know, if they're not negative, they're about contributions to our economy. And I really wanted to share how these folks were contributing to the strength of our democracy. But then after the 2016 election, uh, the form in which the book now is kind of took shape, because what I started to hear was an interest in democracy, but a but people were connecting everything that they were seeing as problematic to Donald Trump. And we knew from our work at New American Leaders and from the stories we were hearing that the problems in our democracy existed long before him and would continue to exist after him. And so the, the book is organized around a series of obstacles that or, or challenges that political newcomers face and I wanted to really flesh those out, but doing it in a hopeful way to show that it was possible to overcome them, but in really in order to have many, many more people like us in office, we needed to dismantle those obstacles. Mm -hmm. So speaking about the stories in the book, I found that one of the things that was so compelling in reading, in reading your book was how each person had to navigate their own way to succeed, right? There were some similarities, but each person had to figure out how to make it work in a specific place, right? So it wasn't just a unified one story. And what I would love to hear from you a little bit is about what were some of the stories that really struck you? And so when you were writing this book, you were thinking, yes, this is exactly why I'm writing this book, especially since some, some of the things that people went to to be successful are really incredible. I mean, this is a story about perseverance in some of these candidate stories. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that um, that struck me as a common theme was how isolating this, both the campaigning and the governance was. You know, like, these are people who, um, you know, there's, there's one person whose story I tell in the book, Sam Park, who is a Korean American, who was the first uh, Asian American Democrat to be elected to the Georgia Assembly in 2016. And actually he was joined by um, someone else who won a special election this year. But he is um, gay Korean American uh, Democrat in the South. And so that can, that is sort of makes him unusual in so many different ways. Um, but in his case, his family really didn't understand uh, political life and didn't ultimately, you know, when he got sworn in, they were there and they sort of understood, but they really couldn't fully understand why he would give up his job as a lawyer 
to make $18,000 a year yeah. in the George House. Um, <laughs> and so there were, I think in every example there's something like that. But the other story that really struck me, which I'll share with you all because it's Washington based, um, one of the people whose stories I tell in this book is Carmen Mendez, who's one of three Latinas who gets elected to the Yakima City Council in 2015. And of the three, uh, two are elected in majority minority districts. Um, so basically, um, there's um, the long story is that there was a lawsuit filed uh, by the ACLU on behalf of two uh, Latinos who had ran for run for office, and uh, the the case that they were making is that. Yakima was in violation of the Civil Rights Act by not having opportunities for Latinos to get elected. And so they went from an at-large district to district-based election. And three Latinas got elected in 2015, two of them in majority-minority districts. But Carmen in a district that is 90% white. And she, I remember, I still remember when she told me the story about how as a council member, she went to the home of one of her constituents who it turns out is her mother's boss and owns a strawberry plant that her mother still uh, packages strawberries in. Um, and so sort of the multiple ironies and opportunities in that story, um, you know, so here's her mother who still has to continue working in order to make a living. Here's a daughter who's a city council member who doesn't get paid enough to be, a, um, to sort of rely on that city council member's salary. And then, you know, the conversation, which we didn't really get into, but the, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall in that room. Yeah. And so there are these, these incredible stories. And I feel like even now when I meet the people who I, whose stories I've told in the book, and talk to them, like there's more stories that come up. So in some ways, this is just the surface of what they experienced. Mm -hmm. But speaking about um, first, one of the things that I kept wondering when I, it, there were so many different uh, benefits that you identified in newcomers and new Americans who are running, but one of the things I was kept thinking about was how things, how the campaign might look different if you're the first, right? So if you're the first person to ever sort of uh, tread this path in the district that you're running. How might that look different? And also, how does that sort of really elevate the challenges for a person to be that first person? Because it seems like so many of the people that yeah. you're talking about in the book, they are their first. Well, you know, it, it's actually incredibly energizing, right? Mm -hmm. Because it motivates people in the community who might not otherwise have participated. I think that for some candidates, uh, there is a kind of national interest if they are going to be, I mean, in this year's election, um, Rashida Tlaib, who's running for Congress in Michigan, you know, was, um, is, and is likely to be, to be going to Congress, is the, would be the first Muslim American woman. Um, but then there were several other high profile Muslim American candidates this year for governor of Michigan and um, Ilhan Omar, whose story I tell in the book. Um, and, and so initially, I think it's incredibly energizing. Um, and then you talked about the challenges. I do think sometimes um, we, when someone is a first, we're, we sort of pour our whole heart into them. And then they have to deal with all our expectations, most of which are unrealistic because you can't suddenly go into the Detroit City Council as uh, just because you were a first and mobilized so many new voters, you don't suddenly walk into the Detroit City Council and pass any legislation that you want, right? And so I think that there is the burden and the blessing of being the first, um, the rapid uh, momentum that you can develop, the stories in the media, but then you also have to pave a way that no one has um, has walked before, um, and you do have to grapple with these unrealistic expectations of what you're going to be able to do. And one thing I'll say is, you know, I'm very, I'm thinking a lot about this this year because of the election and because of the stories of people who are first, but also competing with others. Um, and we have a, a problem, I think, where we, when we think about, we never think there's, you know, here's another white guy asking me for money, but we think, oh wait, but this is another Latina running for office. And so 
um, with the many that we have this year, I think people have struggled with mm -hmm. feeling like um, there's limited resources, even though there really aren't when we're not thinking about people of color. And then I think the other thing is these women if, of color whom we've all heard stories about, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez in um, New York and Ilhan and Rashida and Deb Holland in New Mexico, you know, they're gonna get to Congress, they're gonna be a handful among 435 and or 400 plus, and what, what we are expecting of them is, um, is really aspirational and what they're gonna be able to do is gonna be grounded in a reality that is systemic and, um, and that we can't fault them for because it takes a long time to break through some of those systemic obstacles. Oh yeah, definitely. There's institutional constraints, right? Yeah. And there's, without a critical mass, it can be difficult. You know, part of, I think, the challenge they'll face is looking for um, allies to work with within the institutional constraints of Congress. And I think there are some people, but for sure, I think this is a really excellent point, though, that it, it is a question of what is a reasonable expectation of individuals, right? Symbolically, th these things mean something, but at the same time, one person doesn't have the ability to, you know, fundamentally right. alter 20 major policies. And not everyone wants to buck the institution, right? Mm -hmm. Like, even if they've broken a record and become the first, um, they may not, not all of them are going to want to, mm -hmm. we might have a few of them who kind of integrate into the way the institution mm -hmm. operates now. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I hate to break it to you, but <laughs> yeah, we'll talk more about what's going to happen at the midterms at the end. But uh, uh, so one thing that uh, I also th thought was so interesting is you make this argument in the book that new Americans and newcomers, you feel like they're the, some of the strongest advocates of democracy. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I feel that way partly because I'm an immigrant and partly because the stories that, the things that people have to go through in order to become a citizen, well, first to get here sometimes, there's a huge series of obstacles. Um, you know, it, it's not so much that, um, that we're necessarily the best and brightest in our countries as it is that we have a sense of determination and optimism about what we want for our lives and our families' lives and then by extension what we want for this country and the city and town in which we live. Um, and so I feel the reason I say that is because every moment of every day we're fighting for uh, our place in this country, and I think that we bring that tenacity and determination to democracy. I think this is a really powerful narrative because at least the conventional wisdom, as you know, in political science is that immigrants and specifically some of the, the subgroups that are heavy, racial and ethnic groups that are heavy in the immigrant population in the U.S. are often characterized as low participants in terms of participation, not particularly engaged, and the narrative and the evidence that you're presenting is actually they're very engaged and deeply invested in the project of democracy. And as you call them, you call them an untapped, the greatest untapped political resource, right? And I really liked that because it's turning the, the entire narrative on its head. And so one, I guess a, a question is, how might we imagine a different political environment if that resource was actually fully tapped? Well, we'd have what would more, it, how would it look different? I mean, we'd have the we'd ha the way that we're seeing this surge in voters this year. Um, I tell the story of uh, Athena Salman and Isela Blanc, who ran for state rep in Arizona uh, in 2016. So this is Arizona 2016. Um, this is you know I mean now it seems so far away, but at that time you know it was the most xenophobic and racist election cycle that we had encountered. And they, um, Isela Blanc is a formerly undocumented immigrant um, who became a citizen as a result of the 1984 Immigration Reform and Control Act. And Athena Salman is, uh, her father is Palestinian American. She and her brothers and her father have the last name Salman. Mm -hmm. They were on, uh, they were constant, they believe they were on a watch list because mm -hmm. They were constantly, um, you know, being questioned at airports when they flew after September 11. And these two women won their race for House Rep 
uh, House representatives in Arizona, and they increased voter turnout by 23% in their district. And when they did, they did that basically by door-to-door -door contact with voters who had never heard from someone before, had never heard from someone in elected office. And you've seen the poll, there's a new poll by Latino Decisions about the number of Latino voters who have, it, is it 60%, I think, of Latino voters who have not been contacted by any political campaign uh, or party this year in the midterms. And so what would happen, you know, to answer your question, is that we would see greater rates of participation. I think we'd see a lot more excitement. I mean, in, in New York, we've heard, you all probably have heard about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? And she defeated an incumbent, but what you haven't heard about is that in the state Senate seat, in the state assembly seat, that, you know, in which her congressional, which are in her congressional district, those two races were won in September. The primaries were won by two women, two Latinas, who also defeated Democratic incumbents. So this year alone, in New York, which is a machine town, mm -hmm. three Latinas defeated three Democratic incumbents basically by doing voter contact. And so I think we would have a more robust democracy. The problem is that we don't, somebody asked me today, what would it take to get mandatory voting? And I said, you know, the problem is that the way the system works now, it works really well for the people who are in power. So they don't want mandatory voting and they don't want more voters because they know how to win based on the existing landscape. And once you start to change the landscape, then you get Alexandria and you get Jessica Ramos and you get Catalina Cruz and the dynamic changes and that's unpredictable and scary and also takes current people out of power. Yeah, and I think it also, I mean, what, what, the key thing there also that you said is that it, it takes a lot of effort and, and a lot of energy and it might involve changing strategies, right? So like in Alexandria's case, I mean, she just did an incredible amount of canvassing and getting right. her name out there and being out there and going and recruiting voters that other people had largely ignored or not been very responsive to. And I think that, you know, one of, one of the things I guess I'm, I'm wondering if you would agree with this is, you know, how much does this need to be sort of even a push on Democrats, right? And, and you talk about this some about the ways in which progressives need to be more inclusive of newcomers and new Americans. And so is that not just only on the candidate side, is it also on the voter side? And what kinds of ways would you imagine being more inclusive? What does that look like? So better voter outreach, but what else? Um, well, I think funding campaigns early on um, rather than waiting. I mean, what happened this in this cycle, we've seen a lot of Democrats who ran against incumbents uh, mm -hmm. and were not given support early on. Ayanna Presley's race in, in Massachusetts mm -hmm. is a great example of that. By the way, almost everybody who I write about in this book ran against an incumbent. So mm -hmm. Carmen and Raquel, um, which are, who are in the first chapter, they ran for Detroit City Council and Yakima City Council, but they ran after the council went from at-large to district seats, so there was no incumbent. But many of the stories in this book are about people who ran against Democratic incumbents, and they did not get support, and we're seeing that play out this year. So I think early support um, is really important. Um, also, I think, and this is to me is very fundamental, uh, is that we have to shift our idea of who can run where, right? Yeah. So when we look at someone like me and someone like you, that we shouldn't be relegated to seats that have a large number of Latino voters or a large number of South Asian voters. Like, we ought to be able to be, to run in any district in America. And that is a shift that I think you know, it's real kind of easy to target the Republican Party, but the Democrats are very much a part of the problem because fundamentally this is about power and not mm -hmm. wanting to relinquish power. Mm -hmm. And neither party is particularly excited about relinquishing the positions of power that they have. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a on the one hand, I think the, the excitement amongst voters is attractive to the party, but at the same time, I think it is, it's a fundamental challenge though, right? Running against incumbents is, 
frowned upon in both parties, right, generally. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I think, you know, one of, one of the arguments that you make, though, pretty consistently throughout um, the book is, is not just that these candidates are new Americans, but it's also that they're often treated as outsiders, and not just um, maybe how they feel in terms of racial or ethnic identity, but in particular politically, right? And, right. That, and that you suggest there's a power in the fact that they are an outsider, and that plays a role in their campaign. So can you say a little bit more about how you see that dynamic operate and why are people drawn to this idea of somebody as an outsider? Well, I think that is especially resonant right now. I think people really want, I mean, I think the appeal of a Bernie Sanders and, um, and of Donald Trump is that they, that people felt they were authentic and, you know, not kind of the usual establishment person. And so I do think that our, the candidates I talk about and political newcomers in general bring a level of authenticity and they're not trying to fit a mold. Um, and, and I think that when you are trying to be somebody you're not because you think that that's what's gonna work, voters can see through that, right? Like they're really looking for, can I connect with you and can I trust you and can I then trust you to fight for me? And so I think it's both that they're outsiders, but that they're outside, particularly outside of the usual mold that we expect people to have. Um, and, and I feel like that's, in the book, I talk about that a lot because I think in this moment, it's a particular asset. Mm -hmm. And I just wanna say like, I, at the same time, I think there are shared struggles, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like, there, they may not share their racial or ethnic identity with their voters, but they share the struggle of marginalization, mm -hmm. of uh, you know economic struggles. They share the struggle of not being able to pay co college tuitions as they increase. That sort of thing, I think, is is what like we're not we're finding that our folks who we train and the people who are in this book are knocking on doors and connecting with voters around issues of interest. Mm -hmm. um, and sure you know, it helps that like they might share ethnicity, but that is not the, I think that the majority of voters are turning out for candidates because they feel they're gonna fight for them, not because they have shared ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what you, what you think about um, this idea of, a, of, of how, what, what you think is gonna happen. I'm gonna, gonna preview a little bit on this election, but I guess how you think it's gonna play out with this new wave of candidates in this election and what you think, if those candidates are successful, how you think things might look different in terms of policy or reforms? Yeah, I mean, I would say there are a couple of things. One is that we cannot discount the importance of symbolism because especially at this time, but at any time when I look at Congress or at my state legislature and I see someone who looks like me, or someone with whom I strongly identify, then I feel that it is possible for me to be that person, right? And I think that's really important. Um, we will absolutely see, you know, first black woman as governor, say, in Georgia, or first Muslim American in Congress, and that will mean something. And and so that, you know, I think the, the impact is gonna be you know, symbolic and systemic. And on the systemic side, I think the question is gonna be how many, right? So like if in Arizona you have 10 legislators, new legislators who are willing to fight, it's, it's gonna be a range of like, you know, so many people say to us, and again, I, I know this is a little depressing, but like they feel they've been successful when they've managed to stop bad legislation, mm -hmm. right? And that, that's a big thing. Maybe in some places, all that we will be able to see is that they're stopping bad legislation. In place, in other places, we're gonna be able to see that they're introducing good and getting it passed. I think that's gonna be good. Getting a conversation going about issues that are affecting everyday Americans is gonna be really important. And then I think there's, um, in particular, some things that are coming down the pike that it will make a difference to have state legislators and city council members fighting for. So the census is one. Mm -hmm. You know, we know, we can already predict that there is going to be undercount even among, you know, usually undercounted communities. And so what might a city council member be able to do in terms of supporting community groups to ensure that they're working in communities to at least get 
as accurate account as possible? What might a state legislature do around that? And then what will state legislators be able to do once the numbers come from the census to shape the maps um, that determine how districts will look? So I think those things, I bring up those examples because they have long-term impact, mm -hmm. right? Um, so yes, we might also be able to get in-state tuition, for dreamers, we might be able to pass driver's licenses bills and things like that, but the census and the maps have an impact for the long term. And so those are, I think, some of the things that we're gonna see. I do think there's gonna be a pretty robust conversation about ICE, the Immigration Customs Enforcement, um, that uh, you know we've already heard abolish ICE and what the solutions are gonna be to that and the conversation around that will happen in Congress. It's hard to say on, until we know what the, the outcome is gonna be, um, how much Congress is really gonna be able to change. I, I know that sounds really depressing and I'm really sorry, but I feel like we have to be realistic about what policy change we're gonna see in Congress. But it's not depressing in the sense that, I mean, I think one of the principles underlying people who work on the Hill and they're working in, in policy areas, especially when they're not in the majority party control, is very much a principle of damn, uh, like limiting harm, right. right? If you talk to staffers, they frequently talk about um, the ways they consider it wins when they limit harm yeah. in policies. And I think in this particular moment, um, there is a lot of harm <laughs> that is coming through right. various policies and executive actions. So, even having critical actors who are willing to push back and try to limit that harm, I think could have a really significant positive benefit. I know that's different than getting CIR passed, but right. it's still, <laughs> in this moment, something that I think at least we should count as a win. And don't forget that also, I mean, we know this, like there's, folks are gonna get elected, they're gonna be in running for Congress for a two, you know, they, it's a two year term. So they get there and they're already running again. And that is a systemic problem, right? Like we have this situation in Congress in particular where congressional candidates' campaigns can be so costly. And if we, um, if certain, the seats that are, that lean Republican, if they're won by Democrats, uh, then you will have Democrats having, those Democrats having to fight tooth and nail to get reelected in two years. Um, and so there's also that problem, right, of like you're constantly fighting against the harm and you're trying to run for reelection and money is such a big deal and there will be even, I mean, it seems like every election cycle there's more and more money and certainly in 2020 we're gonna see unprecedented amounts of money thrown at races. Yeah, let's talk some about the money. In your book, you identify two barriers on money, one of which I think is talked about quite a bit, which is the financing part of elections and how increasingly important money is. But another, I think, uh, area that doesn't get as much attention but is, is so important is you identify that many state legislative um, seats and other um, kind of local level seats, they're considered part-time positions, so they have part-time pay. But in actuality, most people work full-time in those positions, and because they're employed in those positions, it becomes very difficult for them to work in any other way when they're technically not in session. And the argument that you suggest there is that both the amount of money that people need to run and this compensation when you get elected creates two significant barriers to having sort of new outsiders actually be able to run even. So there's both the barrier to entry, but then to be able to literally Stay afford there. staying in office. Can you say a little bit more about that and share some of the stories that you heard? Because I think those are really compelling to highlight how much structural sort of inequality is built in there that makes it just really difficult. Yeah, I mean, look, the, that to me was, I would say in the eight years that I've been doing this work, that's been the biggest revelation, right? Like, I think... Yeah, me too. When reading yeah, this book, I was like, wow, oh my gosh, I should yeah, be lecturing on Yeah, I mean, we this. think about people in office as living, you know, the life, right? I mean, and, um, and what I learned in talking to state, especially state legislators, because there is this... Um, you know, 
I mean, basically, our government was created to work for wealthy white landowning males, right? And so their idea of like how we're going to do this is when it's not the harvest season, we're going to go to a state capital or a bunch of us are going to sit in a room and make a decision. And so we have a system of government that is completely outdated for modern America. This, I just had dinner with two um, of your uh, state legislators, Washington state legislators, and I understand it's about $44,000 a year that they make. Now, that's actually pretty good compared to other part-time legislators, but it's, uh, you have the long session and you have the short session, so it ends up being you know, more than a third of the year. Uh, and then what do you do in the other third of the year? Do you, like if your constituent calls you and has an issue or if an advocacy group calls you, do you say, no, I'm sorry, but you know, I'm only paid to work 140 days of the year and I really can't respond to what you're saying. It just doesn't make sense. And in other places, like, so I mentioned Georgia. Georgia, it's $18,000. Um, it hasn't changed in 20 years. Uh, Arizona is $24,000. Also hasn't changed in a really long time. And the political, uh, will uh, to, like, the general public does not have the political will to change salaries for legislators, in part because we are barely making our ends meet, and in part because we think that they don't necessarily need the money. But actually, what I'm concerned about with the cost of public life, which is what I call that chapter, is that, y that money is dictating not just the cost of campaigns, but who can even run in the first place? So if you have student loans and a mortgage and a family, what is the likelihood that you're gonna be able to take a job that pays $18,000 a year, which is ostensibly part-time, but really in pra for all practical purposes is full-time. And when you look at our state legislatures, it makes sense. Like when you look at all of government, it makes sense that there's a lot of older retired folks there's a lot of business owners and there's a lot of lawyers because a lot of people, lawyers, for example, practice during the off session. I mean, that's like, it's, and they may not actually, by the way, in the case of some of these lawyers, you know, they're not necessarily wealthy, but I have seen that there's a larger number of folks who are lawyers are able to do it because they have a private practice and they can, there are not that many jobs. In Texas, by the way, they meet, you know, the Texas state legislature meets every 18 months for six months. I don't know about you guys, but what's the kind of job that you can just be like, oh, but for six months of the year, I gotta go meet in the state capitol, you know? It's just, and, and then the further away you are from the capitol, the harder it becomes, because then you have to get housing, because you're not gonna go back every night. Um, I think it, it, there's a study that's been done about, I, you may have seen this, you know, study about women um, the further away from uh, their homes that the state capital is, the less likely they are to run for office because it means being away from home. And so I think that, to me, this idea of a government for a modern America um, includes addressing this issue of state legislators' salaries and when state legislatures meet and how much work they're able to get done. And by the way, they don't have staff usually. They don't have like full-time staff who's help, who are helping them. Um, they're sharing staff with other legislators or with the caucuses. And so the whole system then, so think, this is the last point I wanna make on this. Like imagine I'm a legislate, legislator, I gotta hold down some other job. I don't have full-time staff. Um, you know, my lobbyists, the lobbyists are coming to me with very fancy reports and data that obviously they, that is biased because they've commissioned this data. I don't have the capacity to be able to process all the different alternatives. And so I'm gonna, like it's not necessarily a um, malicious thing, like you, are presented with information that you think is accurate. You don't have people to go check it out. You don't have the time to do that. And so I, I argue for full-time legislatures in part because I think it reduces some ethical concerns. It increases the number of everyday Americans who can run for office as a viable uh, way of doing public service. Um, and I think it creates a more, um, it can create a class of legislators who are more dedicated full time to serving the community rather than worrying about how they're gonna make ends meet.
Right, so two of the big structural reforms is the full-time legislatures, but also public financing of, mm -hmm. of elections, which you spend a lot of time. So two last questions before we turn to Q&A is, one, in this election, thinking about this critical juncture, what do you see as the biggest barriers to full incorporation in this moment and inclusion in democracy right now in this moment? And what are the ways in which you're, you would suggest to people in this audience or public who's listening to this how they can become more engaged politically and engage the system in ways that you think will be impactful? Well, so I think the biggest issue is going to be the voter suppression. I mean, I think we're going to, we're going to see unprecedented, we are seeing mm -hmm. unprecedented levels of turnout, but, um, and what I'm hoping is that that unprecedented level will kind of, um, you know, balance out the suppression that we're going to see, but the voter purges in Georgia, the suppression, I just think that's going to be a bigger, big thing than ever. And I do think we need to start thinking about, and there have that has happened in some states, it certainly happened in Arizona, like we need to think about what is the position that determines, you know, how, um, how many polls are opened, et cetera, how elections work. I think we need to get people to run for those offices because that is a big area of uh, long-term um, problem in our democracy. I think for, for all of us, um, you know, I jokingly tell everybody that like, well, I seriously tell everybody that they just need to show up to their city council meetings and their school board meetings and their, um, I don't, you know, you can't really go that to many state ledge meetings, but that also, I, the joking part is I might, you know, take a flask because they're going to be kind of boring, although apparently some of them are very interesting. But I think people, a lot of decisions are being made on our behalf behind closed doors. Like, no one's paying attention. And all we need is a few of us to show up and pay attention to what's going on. So that that's one thing that I think everybody can do. Um, I mean, obviously it takes time and not everyone has that time, but if you have the time, I think that's something to do. Um, I, I mean, you know, we talk a lot about voting. I think it's really great if you can take someone who you think, you know, who has an unusual name, who has never voted before, be their partner at the voting booth so that if they are experiencing any kind of challenges to their ability to vote, that there's someone there next to them to fight on their behalf. And then of course, you know, I, I always encourage people to think about running for office, for any level of office, um, especially if you have the means, by which I mean not that you're wealthy, but that you have the ability to spend some time, you know, a few times a month at a city council meeting or at a school board meeting. Great, thank you. So we're going to open it up now to questions from the audience. And I when you talked about uh, the subjects in your book having run against incumbents, and you sort of alluded to the power structure of the parties as being resistant to this incursion, can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe even what you see as um, some significant things that have to happen to the parties to, to sort of free that up or to break the logjam? Um, sure. I think there, the two things that I'll, I'll mention, one is a, um, a kind of like me syndrome, right? So we, uh, we want to support people who are like us in whatever way that might be, whether that's a gender issue, ethnicity issue, um, our fellow legislator. And then the second thing I think is a, it's sort of the devil you know, right? Like sometimes in the case of Carlos Menchaca who ran for New York City Council in 2013, um, he ran against a woman who had not been very effective and had not really shown up in her community, but her fellow legislators really just didn't want to rock the boat and so they didn't want to support someone against her. So those are the two things that I think were the most um, common, right? That like, well, you don't, your, when, when we do the like us thing, it's a kind of like, well, immigrants don't vote, they're not gonna necessarily come out for you. In other words, you know, you don't look like us, 
you don't look like the community, and so therefore people are not going to vote for you. Because obviously it's not just immigrants who are going to vote for, for someone. So, um, and in terms of what we can do, I mean, I think the biggest thing is, unfortunately, it's, um, it rel it, it's dependent on these candidates. Like the more of us who show that we can run and win against the odds, the more likely it is. Because everybody wants a winner, right? So inevitably what happened in the case of Ilhan Omar, who she ran against a 44-year incumbent in Minnesota. Um, and defeated that incumbent. And literally, you know, the day after the election, all the unions and the other party leaders or the fellow legislators who didn't support her were right there next to her. So they just, I think we just need to have enough people challenge the incumbents. Um, first of all, every, there, no incumbent should take their seat for granted, right? So I think prime, op, prime, open primaries are a really, really great idea, and we just need to keep running against people. And sometimes you have to run against people who, they don't have to be bad. They have to just not be so good, and it's okay to challenge them, right? Like er, it, every election should be competitive, but I don't know that that's gonna happen with the parties. You know, I think it's gonna happen with individual individuals. Hi, thank you um, both for this talk. It was really enlightening. Um, you very accurately spoke about systemic barriers that immigrants face when they run for office. Uh, and from that stemmed the discussion about allies. And it got me thinking, I am a young, well, not really that young, but uh, I'm a woman of color and I'm an immigrant. Um, and I also um, am part of the media. I'm a journalist. So I really wanted to ask you what, in your opinion, can be done as an ally uh, that can help shift the narrative and introduce a different dialogue about the realities of immigrants that are running for office um, that you know, I can take away and maybe offer some support in my own job, knowing as well that I face obstacles as a woman of color in the media as well. So you mean as an ally to candidates? I would say as like an institutional ally, if that makes sense. I mean, well, as a journalist, I think this telling our stories is really important. And, you know, the thing that I've heard the most um, in response to this book is uh, a number of people who are running now have written to me and said that they felt like it was so important for them to find language around the things that they were facing. Um, it's not just telling our stories, but telling our stories in ways that validate who we are. Um, and it's surprising to me how little that gets that happened, so that, that I think is one, one big thing. Um, I also think that like we have to be careful, like language is so important, and how we talk about people, um, how we other them by attaching characteristics to them that we don't necessarily attach to. Um, so when we call someone an immigrant woman versus you know candidate for state legislature, um, and and I think there's a way to do that, like that's because to me the biggest biggest thing that is that every single district in America can be represented by anyone at all, regardless of ethnicity. If you can run a good campaign, you can build a coalition, you can talk to voters around values, then it's really irrelevant whether you're an immigrant. It might seem funny because I wrote a book about immigrant candidates, but there's a reason it's called People Like Us, and it's because the idea is that every one of us can connect with some aspect of the stories that I'm telling. And so I think that there's a way to get people to connect to our stories without otherizing us. I would say also though that language and rhetoric matter a lot. And I think journalists are a key part of providing a, a sort of positive narrative uh, regarding groups and they can reframe stereotypes around groups in positive ways that have the ability to be heard by so many people because of the way in which your work is distributed. And that's really it. 
a really significant power of the media. I'm a little bit concerned about the opportunity that a division between what I'd call sort of the new progressive people like us conversation and the classic uh, democratic machine oriented um, element of let's just call it all sort of more of a liberal leaning um, political party or political group does in light of the fact that the conservative machine is just historically been much more disciplined, they control most of the levers right now, and the division in the progressive conversation, even though it's moving in a direction to try to drive that together towards a more inclusive progressive party, if you will, or, or uh, group of people, how, how, how can we have optimism that pushing ourselves to become more inclusive doesn't create an easier opportunity for the more disciplined and organized Republicans to just hold on to things. I, you might not agree with the thesis either, so. <laughs> well, I mean, I, it's not that I don't agree with the thesis. I think the, um, I think that the lack of discipline in, let's say the Democratic Party, um, is, exists independent of this new, um, energy that we're seeing among candidates. Um, and so to me, the larger question is, how are we gonna get to some discipline? <laughs> because, um, so you know, I run a nonpartisan organization, but I'm here as the author of this book. And, and I think, you know, we, in relation to the midterms, I will say that, you know, people have asked me this a lot, and I think what's great about this moment is that we have an incredible amount of energy, mm -hmm. you know, from immigrants and people of color and, and every single sort of aspect of American society is more awakened to what needs to, to our need to participate. But the energy is not a strategy. We still don't have a strategy. And so I, I would just say that, like, getting to inclusivity is not necessarily, I mean, heck, maybe that needs to be the strategy. There's no strategy, and bringing in new vo newcomers is not going to dilute an existing strategy because there isn't a strategy, and I don't think it's gonna, um, I think it, it potentially, there is definitely a division within the Democratic Party that has not been resolved. Um, and w we're not going to get to a third party soon enough to have, you know, have that carry weight. So this reckoning that needs to happen within the Democratic Party needs to happen independent of this. I mean, I, I think my, my take on it is that bringing these new voices in will help, but it's not going to create the strategy. Somewhere, somehow, that strategy has to get created. Thank you. I will also say, I think it's um, important to distinguish in your thesis, and I agree with the thesis, the Democratic Party on average as an organization, whether they have had better strategies compared to Republicans, I think nearly every political scientist in the country would agree with you that with that thesis. Um, but that is different than whether there's intra-party divisions, right? So whether internally within political parties, there's ideological cohesion. And actually in recent um, history, if we're talking about in the last eight years or so, we've actually typically described the Republican Party as having less ideological cohesion than the Democrats, in large part because of the Tea Party that eventually manifested in terms of the House Freedom Caucus, and there's been some very clearly obvious internal divisions within that party. I think it's becoming more public in the Democratic Party, but I think it's also part of our history that parties have to renegotiate how they feel about various policies and ideological positions, but that's a different question to me in terms of whether you have a good electoral strategy in terms of how you run campaigns and organizing, and with Without a doubt, I would absolutely co-sign the Democrats must do better. Hi there. Uh, thank you for your book and for this important discussion. I appreciate it. Um, I have been uh, doorbelling and phone calling for over a decade for Democratic candidates and for, not every year, but often pretty intensively and, um, and for ballot initiatives. And it's, uh, I know that there's research that goes into showing 
uh, th th goes into dis um, deciding who gets the outreach, um, either by phone or in person. And I've always questioned it because it seems like uh, the outreach is done to people who already are registered to vote mm -hmm. or are already voters, and that the whole system is set up um, in a way to not bring in new people. And I wonder, do you think that there is a, a uh, there is a, a radical new way to to conceptualize how this is done that possibly uh, the Democratic Party and other and other political groups could could pursue that the research yes. maybe is just yes. Yes. like, okay, because I feel like the research is like, this is this received wisdom that we're doing this in the way the research shows works, but like somehow the researchers are not quite up on what's going on in the world. Well, I mean, the researchers, and you can speak to this, it, it depends on who the researchers are, right? If it's the party researchers, it's very different from the, I mean, we, I'm not sure, so, there's definitely ways of, and we've worked with uh, some academics on this that are looking at modeling the voter files to see who might be a high, so the, the research is usually to high efficacy voters, right? The people who you can rely. Now, actually that makes no sense, right? Because why would you go knock on people's doors when you know they're gonna vote year after year anyway? Why not go to the people who, and the why not is what I said earlier, because we don't know, they're unpredictable. And then, so in the, in the organization that I run, we, the training, one of the components of the training is around targeting. And one of the things we talk about in the targeting is that you, we train a lot of community organizers and members of immigrant rights organizations about how to run for office. And for them, reaching these low efficacy voters is not as costly as it might be for an establishment candidate who maybe doesn't live in the district, doesn't necessarily speak the language, and that doesn't necessarily mean a language other than English, but just knows how to connect to these voters. And so when you introduce a new candidate into the equation, suddenly because of their name, because of their residency in the neighborhood, they're able to connect to these new and low. So I, I think it's very intentional, is what I'm saying. Like it's not coincidental that you're reaching these same voters because they have predictable patterns of voting. And what I learned in political science is that, you know, that these are the voters, they're voters who are connected and therefore mobilizable, right? Like the mobilization of voters. But what you're seeing now is that grassroots organizations, I mean, what is happening in Georgia and Arizona and Florida is not party led. It is all grassroots organizations. It's grassroots organizations who are saying, how do we get, you know, people with criminal records who have served in prison to be able to vote. It's grassroots organizations who are bringing Latinos into the political process by registering them to vote, by encouraging them to become citizens. That's not party led because that changes the equation. I totally agree with Sayu. I think this is a probability game, literally. Like, what mobilization techniques do we know? And what's our relative payoff and likelihood that they're gonna vote and how much is it gonna cost us to do that mobilization? And some of these other strategies are really long-term, right? Like, so I was talking about the three-pronged strategy of helping people naturalize, then getting them to register to vote, and then getting them to turn out. Well, that's a really long investment in cultivating a set of voters. And a lot of activists and community organizations and kind of grassroots organizations, they're really devoted and committed to those things, but they take a long time, and I think that um, they're often more effective with people from those organizations than they would be from parties. They have no necess necessary communicate, like uh, I guess connections necessarily to those communities. Um, and I think it's just, it's harder, but I think frankly, the parties are kind of strategically calculating who, can, who are we most likely if we wanna get the most people to turn out who's the most likely, but you're right, it's hard to tap new groups of voters if you always go back to the people who always vote. Hi. I have two millennial, millennial kids that are very political, and I notice that they have conversations that are so different from the conversations that I have in my 50s 
um, and being a highly political person myself. They don't seem to see um, the political system the same way that it is. They sort of see it almost as something entirely different or even either that they're not a part of it or that they see it is their responsibility to change it. But when you're talking about the grassroots, so many of these grassroots organizations I see are coming from the millennial sector. Um, when they talk about immigrants, they don't see immigrants the same way I think than older generations do. Or maybe the immigrant millennials may be seeing, seeing themselves differently because of social media, because of the internet. What kind of experiences are you guys seeing from the millennials as they're rising up? Because they're, they're, they, there's some information I've gotten that they don't vote, but in other um, research I've looked at, they do vote. So how are they impacting what we're seeing in this changing face of the political environment? Sure. Well, so at this point, we don't know yet whether millennials are that different from other groups to the extent that what, part of what you're asking is, are they simply young or is there a generational effect, right? So are millennials as a generation different? Um, the oldest millennials are basically 35 right now. So they're a bit older than what we'd call youth voters. But on average, all youth voters, everybody in this room when they were youth would have on average been way less likely to vote than say someone who was over 65. Um, but we're, there, is, there was a lot of hope that millennials were really different in terms of their political attitudes and engagements. There was even some suggestion that millennials were say, for example, much heavily uh, more democratic and more progressive, for example, than prior groups. And a lot of new empirical evidence, particularly coming out of um, the University of Chicago, they do have a whole um, bi-monthly study that's devoted to studying millennials, the Gen Forward survey run by Kathy Cohen in at the University of Chicago, um, shows that actually millennials in many ways look like other groups and they're not necessarily more progressive on race or on gender and on a lot of issues and that some millennials are highly active and highly mobilized but that's true in every generation that there's individuals like that. Um, I think we're not sure yet though what's the final say on millennials and we won't until I think more millennials are older and then we can compare them to the next set of youth that comes behind them. Yeah, I mean, I think like in the sense that, you know, you see they're like all of us in that they have to have an incentive and a stake in what's going to happen. I mean, there's no question that the um, that young dreamers, you know, for example, have been a fundamental part of why we are having a sustained conversation about immigration in this country right now. I mean, at least immigration as it relates to immigration reform, right? That, that for the last now 10 years, right? That, you know, since Dreamers first started the march to Washington and started, you know. Before, since 2006, youth activism. Yeah, they have been, now it is normative to read stories about Dreamers. Um, in a way, and they brought that conversation, the Parkland youth. I mean, I think there is something there, but I think that, like all of us, there has to be a relevance. And, um, the, you know, again, in like all the literature, the sort of traditional political science literature about the people who participate are people with time and money. I mean, in my experience, the people with money don't feel like they have to participate because in many ways they can operate outside of the system, right? Like, sure, you have to pay taxes, you have to do a certain set of things, but otherwise money can buy me what I need. So working class young people maybe feel a greater incentive to participate. But then there's some working class young people who feel completely marginalized and therefore don't participate. So I, I do think the issue of mobilization and, and entities that are mobilizing young people or incidents that are mobilizing young people are very important. But it, ultimately, it's about relevance and what's at stake for me. Um, and like without that, it's very hard to pay the price of voting, which we most of us have to do. Um, I was struck, I was in Austin over the weekend, and there was a GOTV rally, and it was a Saturday, and like you could go vote until seven o'clock. You know, we can't do that in New York. We don't have early voting. I'm gonna be in, in Georgia, I think, for election day, so I have to 
figure out how to, I have to go to some place in New York and like prove that I'm not gonna be in town and then I have to put in my absentee ballot. Now, think about that. That's what I have to do in order to exercise my right to vote in New York. And I'm only gonna do that because I really care about casting my vote. But like, if you're gonna be somewhere for business or you have to work that day, you're not gonna go through that effort. And so we make it really hard for people to participate. And unless you really care, um, unless you're gonna be shamed by your family or your peers, or unless there's something in it for you, it's hard to do it. Washington State, though, it does all their voting by mail. I didn't know if you know that, but it was a big shock to me. There's no more, actually, the experience of voting on voting day and getting your sticker and walking around and you know acting smug that you voted and other people didn't. And then none of that happens in Washington. It's all, all ahead of time. But the logic is exactly what you described, is that it's, in theory, going to increase the number of people who actually vote because you have an opportunity to mail in your ballot and do it at home. So I heard um, from one, from Athena actually um, in Arizona that they change, so it used to be, I don't wanna get this wrong, but basically uh, it used to be that it was, um, like you could complete your ballot and I could take the ballot and take it to the mailbox, but they've, if I'm remembering this correctly, they've made it, I think, a felony in Arizona for you to like help someone with their ballot. So again, do not quote me on this, but what the, the point that you can take away from this is that if you're a Native American yeah. and you don't have a mailbox nearby, all of a sudden now, as a Native American, it's so much harder for me to vote because I can't just have my friend take the ballot. There's a word for it that I miss, that I'm not remembering, maybe you know, like something that, um, there's a term attached to like taking someone's ballot and, and mailing it like, like is being considered. So anyway, these are the ways, these are subtle ways, the things that we don't think about, like who thinks about that? And that story was so striking to me, Strike, so striking and yet I don't remember the term. Yeah, and just also in the Native American case as well, that if you don't have a mailing address, right, then you can't register to vote if you have a P.O. box. But if you lived on a reservation in some places of the country, then the post office will only give you a P.O. box because you don't have a street address. But then what does that mean if you can't register to vote, right? right? And this is going back to your earlier point on the barriers that are being constructed in this particular election and how that will suppress voting. And sometimes that's very intentional and sometimes, I mean, you go back to like, why does it matter that, you know, Native Americans are on state legislatures or on city councils because they will be able to talk to that experience in a way that, you know, someone who uh, hasn't had that experience can't do. Any last questions before we wrap up? Okay, well, thank you so much, Sayu. This was a great conversation. Thank you. And thank you to all audience. of you for coming.